morning, the sub Senate Subcommittee on Ethical Conduct will come to order. Today is Wednesday, April 8th. It is 10.04 a.m. Uh, members, before we get started, um, I'd like to do introductions of individuals around the table. Um, we'll start with myself. My name is David Osmick, President of the Senate, representing District 33 for the next six months and 16 days or so. Uh, starting on my right, Staff member uh, Pete Globa, Senator Torres Ray, uh, staff member Wendy Havisto. I see I messed that up on the Senate floor, didn't I? <laughs> staff member Tom Byron, uh, uh, Senator Champion, and Senator Kiffmeyer, the wonderful <laughs> Senator Champion. We do have additional staff at each one of the tables, but they're not anticipated to prop, um, anti anticipated to participate. Uh, today. Uh, next, we will speak. Or we will have Mr. Bodderin uh, explain some of the background and procedures for today's hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Um, I have provided you with some written information uh, previously about the requirements and Senate rules for um, the first hearing that the Subcommittee on Ethical Conduct is required to hold. Um, this is termed a probable cause hearing, although the subcommittee has several options before it um, in responding to the complaint that has been filed, uh, the complaints, excuse me. The Senate Rule 55.4 prescribes three um, possible outcomes for the, the first hearing held by the subcommittee or, or series of hearings. Within a 30-day period of time after the complaint is filed, the subcommittee is required to meet and either make a finding of no probable cause, um, which um, can best be described as a decision that the complaint, even if everything in the complaint were assumed to be true, um, does not state any kind of a claim that the subcommittee can take action on. A second option for the subcommittee is to take a vote and agree to defer action on further proceedings with, uh, with either complaint until a particular point in time. Uh, and a third possibility uh, is to determine how the subcommittee should proceed with investigation by taking a vote. Um, after um, deliberating and receiving information from the complainants and from Senator Fate, the, the subcommittee could determine that particular avenues of investigation are called for um, in uh, its effort to reach a decision on, on both complaints. A little more detail. Um, with regard to the evaluating probable cause um, and, and stated, uh, I think, a little with a little more clarity, the subcommittee um, must at some point attempt to ascertain whether if the facts presented in the complaint were presumed to be true, the conduct described in the complaint would be subject to discipline under Senate rules. So I, I, another step the subcommittee should take in considering statements made by both the complainant, um, the complainants, and Senator Fate is whether uh, what the probable value of evidence that has been provided and attached to the complaint and in response to the complaint would be. Um, <coughs> finally, um, just a little bit more detail about um, what the subcommittee has traditionally done at the first hearing when receiving the complaint. But basically, in essence, both parties are provided the opportunity to present um, information about the complaint and a response to the complaint. And that basically takes the form of explaining uh, the written documents that have been submitted to the committee. Um, and, and both of those um, sets of documents have been posted um, for, this, for this hearing. The, um, another requirement, that, well, it, a way the subcommittee has traditionally con conducted the, the first hearing is to require that anyone providing testimony to the subcommittee is placed under oath. Um, and, that I think, Mr. Chairman, is something that you have on your um, agenda as well. So in addition to presenting the complaint and response to the complaint, um, the subcommittee um, will take time to ask questions of both um, the complainants, uh, complainants and, and then also, uh, in turn, uh, when their information is presented, um, what, is, what is done in the way of the response to the complaint. There is an opportunity for each party to question uh, the other party during the course of the, the probable cause hearing. Um, traditionally, the subcommittee has not ventured beyond 
uh, testimony from either party to the complaint. Um, they have brought in additional witnesses in the course of conducting the probable cause hearing. Um, the, in essence, uh, the probable cause hearing is really a decision on what steps the subcommittee should take next. Um, and again, that is subject, um, the, the subcommittee is required to reach a decision uh, in one of the three avenues that I described previously within the 30-day time limit after the complaint has been filed uh, under, under the Senate rules impose that time requirement. That, I think, Mr. Chairman, is what I would have for you summarizing the process for today, unless there are questions. Any questions for Mr. Botterin? So, members, uh, just sort of as a housekeeping item, my uh, plan is to hold this hearing at least through noon, possibly beyond to that to 1230. Um, it is, this is our opportunity to listen to both sides of the complaint, listen to the, uh, to establish facts. Um, and then uh, it is not, I'm not anticipating that we will actually act upon any action, action any action today. Uh, I want us to very carefully listen to what is being presented, um, consider those options, and we have scheduled a second hearing on the 15th, I believe it is, um, that we may may or may not take additional action at that point in time. But by Senate rules, we do have to have this meeting, uh, this uh, convene this committee to hear this complaint within 30 days, as Mr. Botterin indicated. So this meets the requirement of the timeline. Any questions? So what we will do is we're going to hear from the complainants first. Uh, the respondents will be able to ask questions of the complainant, uh, vice versa. Uh, if we can get through all of these today, that would be great. If not, uh, if we get close to 12 o'clock, we may suspend and then come back the next day. We may go a little longer if we have to, if we have some additional time on our calendars. Um, I do know, I do know there, there are at least a couple individuals that have some other obligations this afternoon, so I'm trying to be respectful of that, but we needed to get this hearing done. Senator Champion. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, just for clarification, so are we allowed to ask questions, um, uh, let's say for an example, the, the complainants um, who put forth the complaint, uh, um, once they present, are we allowed to ask them questions or, or is it your pleasure for us to let the complainant go and then the subject of the complaint go and then we ask questions of both. I just, I just want some clarity around that. I would suggest, and there aren't any firm rules, I would suggest this would make a lot of sense, that we would listen to the complainants, allow the respondents to respond to the complainants, and then ask questions of the complainants, and then in turn, when the complainants or the respondents complete their case, the complainants can then speak to that, and then we can ask questions. So we would be getting the last bite at the apple, listening to both sides debate their or debates, so to speak. With that, uh, any individual who is going to an anticipate speaking uh, at this uh, hearing does need to be sworn in under oath. I would ask that they stand uh, now and stand in the back of the room so that we can administer the oath. So, to the four individuals who anticipate speaking, do you swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but this truth, so help you God? I do. I do. Thank you. So we will begin with the presentation of the complainants. Uh, the designee for the complainants in this case is Senator Coran. Senator Coran, the floor is yours. Mr. Chair, um, from a procedure perspective, would you prefer we just deal with complaint number one, do Q&A from that perspective, um, or go through the entire complaint for both articles? A uh, very good point, and actually I had thought this through. Uh, I think it is better for us to compartmentalize. They are two independent counts. So I, my suggestion, Senator Coran, is you present complaint number one, um, provide any additional testimony to that. The respondents then can respond to complaint number two, 
and then we will have questions. If we have any questions, we will discuss those from the, from the board to the individuals. So, uh, and we'll follow that procedure with complaint number, the complaint number two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, glad to be before you today, Mr. Chair, and, and so to just speak of the the uh, ethics complaint against Senator uh, Omar Fate. Um, it's brought forth today um, by multiple senators, Senator Eichhorn, Senator Goggin, Senator Jasinski, Senator Johnson, Senator Matthews, and Senator Newman, in, a, in addition to myself. And really, complaint number one deals with the violation of Rule 56.3 and 56.4, and by failing to disclose a conflict of interest, which we're all required to, to uh, disclose at any time, um, despite receiving preliminary uh, or the primary election campaign promotion from a Somali TV station of Minnesota free, free of charge and subsequently authorizing legislation appropriating $500,000 to the same organization. So what I'd like to do, Mr. Chair, is just kind of walk through those issues and, and with the supporting evidence, um, or which was included for everybody in the supporting evidence. Uh, Somali TV is a Minnesota, of Minnesota is a registered uh, business with the U.S. Department of Treasury. It's 501c3. Um, registered since 2015, and it's currently registered with the Minnesota Secretary of State as both a nonprofit and a limited liability cor corporation. It has, a, has an organization that maintains a YouTube channel of just about 171,000 subscribers. Issue number two, or, or item number two, according to the IRS website, any organization that has a 5013C status, it cannot participate or intervene, um, include publishing, distributing, distributing statements or any political campaign on behalf or in opposition to any candidate in public office. The Somali TV of Minnesota, the YouTube channel hosts several campaign related videos featuring Senator Fate in both in English and the Somali languages. Following his DFL, I'm sorry, um, point number four, following the DFL endorsement um, as Senate District 62 candidate, Senator Fate appeared in a video, please vote for Omar Fate, Minnesota Senate, August 11th, uh, June 20. 5th, 2020, um, and on Somali TV of Minnesota, referring to viewers to his campaign and website. Asking viewers to sign up in, in, for volunteer shifts and explaining how viewers can donate. So the campaign video. Despite the campaign-related content, Somali TV of Minnesota, featuring Senator Fate, uh, did not include any disclaimers, including those required by the Fair Campaign Practices Act under Minnesota Statute 211B.04. Item number six, on the complaint. March 22nd, 2021, Senator Fate introduced a Senate File 2238, a bill appropriating $500,000 from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund to, the Somali, to that very same Somali TV um, company of Minnesota. Senate Rule 56.1, the reason we're bringing this forward, it provides that members adhere to, it's part of our, the Senate ethics uh, requirements or rules, requires that members shall adhere to the highest standard of ethical conduct embodied in the Minnesota Constitution, state law, and these rules. Point eight, Senate Rule 56.3 provides for the improper conduct includes conduct, violates the rules of the Senate, violates accepted norms of Senate behavior that betrays the public trust or that tends to bring the Senate into dishonor or disrepute. Senate Rule, item number nine, Senate Rule 56.4 provides that members of the Senate shall disclose potential conflicts of interest in discharge of their senatorial duties as provided by the Minnesota statute in 10A.07. Item number 10, Minnesota statutes also, 10A.7, provides that a legislature who in discharge of their official duties would be required to take action or make appropriate decisions that would substantially affect the official's financial interest and prepare a witness statement describing that matter involving the potential conflict of interest to the presiding officer of the body. Point 11, there is no evidence that Senator Fate disclosed his con conflict of interest in the Somali TV um, Minnesota to the president of the Senate or the public. According to Minnesota, uh, uh, in addition to that, um, Mr. Chair, they both um, financial reports of the campaign finance board that were disclosed or that were provided by Senator Fate, neither of them reflect a payment for those particular ads. Point number 12, according to the Minnesota Reform article dated May, May 2nd, 2022, um, the center was promoted by a nonprofit then proposed a $500,000 state funding for it. Somali TV president Said Salah said that in the interview that Salah, Somali TV does not endorse candidates, but allows them to send in ads, which the channel runs free of charge. 
On point 13, Minnesota statutes 211B.13, subdivision 2, prohibits a person from knowingly soliciting or receiving, accepting any monetary value that is dispersed or prohibited by this, by this section, by the section in, in uh, 211B.15. We also go on in, in point 14, statute 211B.15, subdivision 2, prohibits corporations from making contributions directly or indirectly of any monetary value to an individual to promote the individual's candidacy or election to a political office. Point 15, per Minnesota statutes 211B.01, subdivision 5, disbursement means the act through which money, property, or other things of value are directly or indirectly promised to Paid, spent, contributed, or lent. In reference to where this is clarified, as held in, in point 16 in Adams versus uh, B. Anderson and the Clatt True Value Hardware Electric Company, um, the Office of Administrative Hearings um, ruling, it was in a violation, um, it is a violation of the prohibition against corporate contributions for a corporation to display signs that support a candidate without fair market uh, remuneration regardless of value. Point 17, when, the interviewed by the, when interviewed by the Senate or the Minnesota Reforming University of Minnesota law professor, David Schultz goes on to state that Senator Fate seeking money for Smiley TV uh, after they aired the endorsement of him is, is at the very least a conflict of interest and could have potentially um, be deemed a quid pro, quid pro quo. Point 18, Senator Fate failed to report the value of the campaign advertising displayed by Somali TV of the Minnesota um, LLC to the Minnesota Campaign Finance Board and Public Disclosure Board, but authored a bill, again, the same bill, for $500,000 to the same organization less than three months after being sworn into office. And again, his original filing nor the amended filing for that period don't, do not show payments for those advertising, either in kind or monetary. Point number 19. Um, Senator Fate's uh, conduct violates accepted norms of Senate behavior, betrays the public trust, and brings the Senate into dishonor and disrepute. It's our belief that based on the above information and supporting documentation that was provided to all, that uh, Senator Fate violated uh, Senate Permanent Rule 56. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, um, that is the content of the information in which we have for the uh, in the original complaint we wanted to cover in the overview. Any further, Senator Coran, anything further you want to add to the complaint number one prior to us moving on to the respondent? Mr. Chair, at this point, um, we do not. We will now then hear from the respondent to, to complaint number one. Um, Senator Fateh or Ms. Kendrick, which one would like to speak first? Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Coran. Now, nah, Mr. Chair, I will, uh, I will defer until after. Senator, I'm sorry. Ms. Kendrick, looks Kendrick. like you're eager to speak. Ms. Yes. Kendrick. Yes, Mr. Chair, I will. Please introduce to yourself for the record, please, and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Kristen Hendrick. I am uh, the attorney for Senator Fate. Um, Mr. Chair, Senators, thank you again for allowing us the time to address these allegations today in the hearing. Um, we, we feel that we are here and um, have the opportunity to fill in some blanks that are definitely left by the uh, complaints uh, that has been brought forth by the complainants. Um, to begin with, I will just note that ethics allegations are very serious um, and obviously should not be taken lightly. Um, Senator uh, Fatelik, like everyone else here knows and understands the importance of maintaining the integrity and the ethical obligation uh, commanded by his office. Um, the allegations before the subcommittee today are fundamentally based in rumor. Uh, they stem primarily from news articles that are based on assumptions and rumor, not based in fact. However, these unsworn statements are being touted as truth by the complainants. Um, as we all know, printing information doesn't make it fact. Uh, and printing that information in a complaint doesn't make it fact. Um, so we he we're here today to provide that necessary fact to the subcommittee, uh, facts that show 
that the evidence before the subcommittee today does not rise to the level to warrant further investigation. Um, in addressing complaint number one regarding a potential conflict of interest um, and the allegations surrounding what has been alleged to be a free campaign endorsement, um, as well as then the subsequent authoring of the legislation to appropriate the $500,000 to that same organization. Um, the allegation, this allegation is based on a false premise, and that false premise is that Senator uh, Fata did not receive uh, this a free election endorsement. In fact, Senator Fata, as you can see with the evidence that we've presented to the subcommittee, um, paid for a campaign advertisement with Somali TV. Um, furthermore, there's no connection then between that advertisement and his later authoring of the appropriations bill. Um, I will note, as we have provided to the subcommittee, uh, we've shown that first and foremost, this was a paid for advertisement. Uh, we did provide, I will direct your attention to the uh, screenshots of the receipts from Cash App of the $1,000 total paid by Senator Fata um, across two payments for the creation of and airing of ads on the channel. As you can see, um, unfortunately, clearly visible on the, the Cash App, he did in error make those payments from a personal Cash App account as opposed to his campaign Cash App account. Both are on the same app on his phone, requires logging out, logging back in. When this error came to his attention, he has now, in fact, um, completed and filed a report amendment reflecting that payment. Um, but again, this was a paid for advertisement. The ad was not an endorsement. And I will also um, note for the subcommittee is very similar is the same as the ads that multiple other uh, local politicians have made on Somali TV. Um, I will note that those ads um, are similar in form. Um, they all have titles of vote for or Ukodi, which is Somali for Kode? Uode. Uode, OK. Um, that is Somali for vote for um, the candidate in question. And none of the ads actually contain, um, contain the Fair Campaign Practices Act disclaimer. Unfortunately, it was left off by Somali TV, um, all of those ads. So I will, uh, if the subcommittee would like, I will take a moment now and we can show a variety of those ads um, to illustrate this point. Um. So I uh, believe there's a video that they, uh, you wanted to have. Um, we can queue up the video. It's part of the presentation of the response. So we'll do the video first. Senator Fate, you had something to say before we play this? Uh, yes. Um, I, I believe we submitted uh, 15. Uh, thank, you first, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe we submitted uh, 15 videos. But to save you time, I mean, I'm just going to do four or five of them um, so, so that we don't drag on um, the process. Um, I just want to turn your attention to that um, Somali TV has done uh, political ads like this, um, not in support of any candidate, but um, just like an awareness. Uh, Somali TV has been a community bulletin board, essentially, um, for the Somali community. And uh, for example, they use the same language in this video, vote for Walls and Flanagan 2018. Um, at the end of it, there's, at the end of this video as well, uh, there's no disclaimer on it as well. Um, and you can see here that they're also talking in a similar way about their campaign uh, and why they're running um, in an interview setting. Um, going more over to uh, 2014, uh, Dan Severson running for uh, Secretary of State, who was a Republican, um, speaking to... ...that we need in America to advance, and every one of our children should have the opportunity for an education that will help them succeed. So. Clearly here, um, this is another uh, situation where the ad says, vote for Dan Severson, um, November 4, 2014. And if you fast forward to the end of the video, uh, there is no, there is actually, there is a paid for and authorized by Dan Severson. Um, now going to 20, 
I believe, uh, I'm not sure what year this was, 2014, I'm sorry. Um, it says vote for Senator Al Franken. Um, I need to refresh this video, I apologize, because it ended. Um, give me one moment, please. And in this video, um, Senator Al Franken uh, was doing uh, an interview. Uh, uh, an interview with a Somali voiceover um, so that um, he can speak to the Somali community about why he's running for re-election, uh, what he stands for. Um, and the title says, uh, speaking with Senator Al Franken. But at the end of the video, um, if we fast forward to the end, it says, vote for, vote November 4, United States Senator Al Franken, uh, Minnesota. Um, moving on, um, we see another video for uh, now City Council Member Michael Rainville. Um, he had a similar campaign Sudawa. video. My name is Michael Rainville, and I'm running for the third ward City Council seat in Northeast Minneapolis, Southeast Minneapolis, and half of downtown. I'm so proud to have the Somali community as my friends. When I went to the mosque to ask for advice, I was told that public safety is very, very important, that too many Somali citizens are being victimized by crime, and I am a big supporter of, of the police. So clearly right now, uh, now city council member, at the time candidate, was speaking directly to the Somali community uh, and was using Somali TV as a platform um, to uh, drive voter turnout and get their support. Um, at the end of the video also, you will see it says, uh, uh, November 2, 2021. in English means vote for. Finally, this is another video, Tina Smith for uh, which means uh, United States Center, uh, United States Senate. Um, and this is another situation in which um, uh, you see the words vote for. Now, the way the Somali TV uh, operates is that um, these are not endorsements. Um, the people coming to them uh, that want to use their space, um, they give them the caption to use. So when I go to them, for example, I say, uh, the caption of the video is vote for Omar Fateh. Uh, same thing with Senator Tina Smith, vote for Tina Smith. Uh, it is simply just the caption. It is not uh, an endorsement, and it's not Somali TV uh, telling folks to vote for them. It is just them using their platform uh, to do so. And I'll pass it back if, to um, Kristen. Uh, Ms. Hendrick, any additional comments oh, before we go to rebuttal by the complainants? <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as, as is outlined by the videos, I'll just note um, that this is obviously a platform that is used, has been used uh, to air ads for campaigns by many local politicians. Um, again, as can be seen in the videos, both the ones that we've highlighted, we've shown today, and the ones that were provided to you prior to this hearing and are available online, um, again, these are, are paid advertisements that are open to candidates of both parties. This is not something that it's, um, there's no favoritism, there's no endorsement or um, patting of anyone's back uh, with, these, with these ads. Um, it's simply the business of providing this service um, on the platform. Um, as, as Senator Fatah has mentioned, um, Somali TV is, is more of an, an NPR, if you will, for the Somali community. Um, in terms of a source of local news um, and a source of, of information about what's going on in their community. Um, so it is definitely a place that, that the community would be looking for um, information about candidates that they're going to have on their ballots when, when they go to the, to the polls. Um, I will note as well, we have provided an affidavit of uh, Siad Saleh with uh, Somali TV. Um, this is a sworn statement, as you know, uh, indicating, again, that this was a paid-for ad by Senator Fatah. Um, it was not a free endorsement, and there was no expectation that anything else would come um, from the ad beyond payment for the ad, like anyone else has, has paid, obviously, for their ads as well. Um, I will just note as well that, obviously, this is a sworn statement, as opposed to the unsworn comments uh, that have been that have been actually printed in in newspaper articles um, so I would encourage um, the the subcommittee to really 
to take into account the gravity of that, of a sworn statement versus unsworn comment. Um, I will also note then moving along um, in complaint number one, there are the allegations that Senator Fata, uh, again, based on the false premise of a free endorsement, uh, that Senator Fata went on to bill, uh, to author a bill, an appropriations bill for money for Somali TV. Um, again, this is based on a false premise of an unpaid free endorsement. Uh, however, if we look forward um, as well, this appropriations bill that was authored was authored by Senator Fata when he was new in office and looking to the direction of his colleagues for what he should do as a new state senator. Um, he definitely, he wanted to make an impact and he looked to his colleagues um, who had also been in the office who he knew were doing great and meaningful work for their constituents and in their communities um, to see what, what examples there were of legislation that he should also be working on and, and the way he should go forward um, with the responsibility of his office. Uh, so with that, he looked to follow the example of other senators, again, that he knew were doing important work, senators like Senator Champion, um, who also authored appropriations bills for, for community organizations, as can be seen in the packet of um, draft legislation that we also provided. Um, I will just, I won't go through each of those one by one. I know that you have that in your possession to review. Um, but again, as a new state senator, Senator Fata looked to the example of others, saw this example of drafting, of draft legislation um, for appropriations bills to get money for community organizations, um, and felt that this was something that he should also do to help his constituents um, and to help his community. So once he learned about that, um, he knew the importance the, the draft um, appropriations bill in question in this complaint is the uh, appropriations bill for $500,000 for Somali TV. In that instance, he knew that Somali TV was important to many of his constituents. It's a community bulletin board, as he said, again, like NPR for, for that community. Um, and he submitted the draft legislation to support and grow that community resource, um, the same as his peers did. I will note um, for the subcommittee as well, though, that this is the second smallest appropriations bill we could find that he actually authored. Um, and in fact, he was the chief author on a number of other um, appropriations bills as well. I'll note um, that on SF 3951, that was an appropriations bill that he was the chief author on for Pillsbury United Communities um, grant that was for $27,800,000 million, $27 million um, in SF 3237. He was the chief author on an appropriations bill um, for the Native American Community Clinic for $12 million. In SF 30, uh, 4365, it was the Philando Castile Community Service Center for $500 million. And in SF 3786, he was the chief author on an appropriations bill uh, for the East Phillips Neighborhood Institute for $20 million. So I think that's important to take into account as well, that this is not a situation of quid pro quo, obviously, that's based on the false premise of this uh, free endorsement. Um, and, and additionally, it's not a situation of um, Senator Fata. It seems there seems in the allegation in this complaint to be something of uh, Senator Fata looking out for his own. In fact, he's looking out for, his, for all of his constituents, for all of his community, um, and seeking actually very minimal um, financial support for a Somali community resource compared again to the $500 million, the $20 million, um, the almost $28 million to all of these other community organizations as well. So while, while the complainants have kind of gone through and picked and chosen 
information to support their claim, I will note that when, when the full range of facts is reviewed, I mean, is considered, it paints a very different picture. And one of Senator Fata simply acting as any other senator has, um, as any other local politician has, uh, paying for ad space on Somali TV. Um, and also as a, as a senator who has been looking out for and trying to provide funding for community resources, uh, the same as many other, all of his other colleagues, all of his other colleagues in the room today um, would do for their constituents. Um, I will just briefly also respond uh, at, at the beginning uh, complaint of their discussion, complainants obviously brought up the 501c3 status of Somali TV. Again, I would, I would argue that that is outside of the scope of this complaint and anything that Senator Fata that we can really reply to. Um, so again, we do not, I do not represent uh, Somali TV. I cannot speak to their status um, as their counsel, as a tax lawyer, anything like that. I would say that those are, are better um, discussions to have with Somali TV and not with Senator Fata. Obviously, again, he has, has just acted as many other local politicians have um, with that community resource, using it as a, a platform to, um, again, to pay for ad space, the same as so many other local politicians you can see have done. Thank you. Rebuttal, uh, Senator Coran or other designee? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I, what I'd like to do is uh, go through a few of the uh, rebuttal statements. So one is the, the receipt. The receipt that was provided um, doesn't really show or prove anything except a payment was made um, of 500 hours. There is no indication of what that receipt is for, um, whether it was made by Saeed Salah for on our behalf of Senator Fateh, or that if it was his personal account uh, made to his side, it reflects um, a payment, but it also doesn't reflect what it was for. And so it, it doesn't reflect the production of a video, those aren't free either, and or the um, running of the video. And so I guess I would have the question of, of uh, and with the lack of proof being provided, um, what is that receipt for? Was it for the production of the video, or at least claiming the production of the video, or the running of particular ads? Uh, Ms. Kent, Ms. Hendricks or Senator Fate, would you like to respond to that question? Mr. Chair, uh, Senator, as I will note that on the receipts that have been provided um, in the packet of information as well as we previously provided, um, the receipt clearly states that it's for Omar Fata video, um, so it does note what the receipt is for. Um, obviously, using Cash App, which is something that perhaps the subcommittee like me uh, is not as savvy on all of these other app-based <laughs> payment methods, but obviously on, on Cash App, um, it does it, it doesn't provide you know it doesn't provide as many line items. Um, but again, on this specific receipt. It very clearly states that it's for Omar Fata video. You can see that right underneath uh, where it says $500. Um, it also notes where it is going to, to Somali TV, Minnesota, um, right at the top of the receipt. Um, additionally, uh, as we noted, um, we are here today to provide that information. Obviously, the complainants did not have the full breadth of, of uh, facts and information um, when they came forward with their complaint. Um, and again, we can turn to the sworn statement um, of Syed with Somali TV, Minnesota, um, to explain this payment as well. Um, I will just draw your attention to the um, affidavit that was provided. And paragraph six of that affidavit um, in the sword, sworn statement uh, of Syed Salah with Somali TV, um, he indicated that candidate Fata paid $500 to Somali TV um, on June 22nd, 2020, and an additional $500 to Somali TV um, for broadcasting campaign ads. So um, Senator Champion has a question to this point. I just want to clarify something. We keep saying $500. In reality, it's $1,000. Is that not correct? 
It is. Ms. Hendrick? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, it is 500, it is two $500 payments. So when we're repeating uh, the repetition of $500, um, in total it is $1,000. To that point, Senator Champion. Thank you. Um, to the testifier, is there any documentation to show what the total amount was that needed to be paid to uh, Somali television? Even if you're doing the ads, usually you get information that says, if you run five ads at this amount of money, here's what it's going to cost, and so that we can balance, um, you know, the payments. Like, if these are the payments, what's the total amount that was supposed to have been paid to Somali Television? And do you have any documentation that will show what that total amount was to, was to be? Senator Fute. Uh Yeah. Um, there wasn't like uh, an invoice or anything of that nature uh, that I can remember. Um, it was just an oral agreement and we came in, we recorded and I paid. Um, and the, I think the cash app reflects the, the correct amount um, for the agreement. Senator Champion, anything additional? So there was no, uh, no written agreement, it was oral. Um, and if it was oral, um, is there any reason why you would think that it was that oral agreement would not be reflective in the affidavit? Like from Saeed, it doesn't say that there was an oral agreement for a certain dollar amount. It says that there were payments made, but it doesn't say what the what the total amount was supposed to be. Ms. Hendrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Champion, I I agree with you. I know we're both reading the same document here. Um, and so I, I'm not going to invent that there is a, a line where, he, where um, Syed Salah specifically said it was an oral ag agreement. I will note, however, there is no indication that it was a written agreement or an oral agreement. It simply states that they had an agreement that he would do this, um, that he paid this amount of money. Um, and then in paragraph 7, um, that there was no additional compensation or consideration exchange for broadcasting the campaign ads. Um, I think what's most important here is the fact, if, if we look at what's in the complaint um, that complainants brought, um, I think the most important thing here is that this was a paid ad which is reflected by, again, the receipt um, and the affidavit. And again, there was no further um, compensation, consideration that was expected. This was payment in full for the service. Senator Champion. Uh, Ms. Kendrick, with, without belaboring the point, you would agree with me that it does not say that there was no additional money that was due under the agreement. It only says in paragraph 7 that there is no promise or additional compensation or consideration in exchange for broadcasting the, the campaign ads, right? So... Uh, so, I mean, we can read that many different ways. I'm just trying to get clarification, not being adversarial. I just want to flesh this out so that we can be really clear here. Ms. Hendrick. Mr. Chair, um, Senator, obviously as, um, as lawyers and for everyone here today as politicians, we all know that words and language matter. Um, however, I, we also know that when we go to construe the words, Sometimes we can, we can look at the language, and even if something isn't explicitly stated, we can understand the meaning of, of the language. Um, I think reading, again, this, this feels like we're um, going through and trying to figure out what, you know, what, what a law means, or we're doing this legal analysis. But within paragraph 6 and 7, when read in together, when read in conjunction with each other, um, Syed Saleh said first that Candidate Fata paid $500 on one day and an additional $500 on another day. And then he further said that in paragraph seven that he did not promise any additional compensation or consideration. Um, I would posit that that would indicate that that was payment in full. There was no additional compensation of, of any kind that was being um, expected. So um, whether it be in a you know, another cash app transfer or some other pat on the back down the road. He, there was no further expectation of payment. Uh, we're going to continue Ms. with Senator Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you. 
Um, so particular to the receipt, the, the receipt provided does provide, um, or hasn't been provided in the conversation, hasn't proven there's ever an invoice and or a receipt that Senator Fate actually made a payment. There is a receipt that implies that Mr. Saeed Salah, Saeed Salah was the one who made the payment. It's $500, there's really no detail. Um, our campaign finance rules are very clear. Um, and to do this business and the training is very clear. It's our obligation as, as candidates and senators to make sure that we remove and follow and adhere to, adhere to all of those. Very few private payments are made for candidates out of a cash app or in cash um, to make sure you have proof that there's a payment made. The information they provided proves none of it. In addition to none of it was reflected in any campaign reports at least up until April 2nd for the and his most recent updated um, campaign finance report for that particular period. And none of them reflect a payment to and or from uh, anyone on behalf of Senator Fate for those services to Somali TV. Any further Mi discussion? Mr. Chair? Sarah yep, Mr. Chair, in addition to the, um, the video to, to uh, the videos that were shown, um, also show no proof of anything based on the claims that we made about those activities specific to Senator Fate. Again, campaign rules are very clear. It's the candidate's obligation to make sure that all of those um, disclaimer statements are proven. They've had many videos. So after the first video, did they not catch it? Or the second or the third or the fourth or how many, however many are there? Um, none of the information they provided proves any of that or disproves any of the information which we provided. And so I would argue that our, our claims still stand and hold true. It is the candidate's obligation to make sure that those things are taken care of. Mr. Chair, in addition to um, support for other legislation and grants, those do occur all the time. The examples that were provided are one of many and for both sides we do that. But many of them are not, we don't have a single relationship with those organizations, they're good and they're also not providing endorsements or any services, either perceived or real, in kind and or in a true monetary value. So they've proved nothing to disprove our claim that, um, or anything within our claims. The, others, the other component, the 5013C status, again falls into the same line of I didn't know or I'm not responsible. We are responsible when we sign up and to run for office. Campaign finance is very clear. It is our obligation to understand who you can and can't accept the donation for. And it's really clear and really simple to use. Thus, the collection of information that's been provided clearly violates or shows that the, the violation or the lack of um, accuracy or authenticity of the information to try and counter our claims, I think, is null and void. None of it's proven or none of it's disproven our claims that um, it is the obligation, a 5013C, and the rules that campaign finance lays out and how those things work. Um, doesn't matter the monetary value, right? An in-kind donation of, of a dollar in violation law is still a violation. And so I would argue that none of the information that they provided um, disproves our claims. Additional rebuttal, Senator Fateh or Ms. Ms. Hendricks? And then we will have questions from the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will just go through uh, some brief rebuttal to each of the points um, that has been brought up by the Senator. First and foremost, um, in terms of the cash app receipt, I, I will note again that it does clearly state on the receipt um, what, this, what this payment was for. Um, it, it notes specifically for Omar Fata video. Um, additionally, we have provided the affidavit of Syed Salah that indicates what that payment was for. Um, again, with the new way of, of doing business with more online payments, um, as we know, if even anyone who goes online to make their online bill payments for their you know, water bill or electric bill, you don't get a, a receipt the same as if you went to a cashier, um, you get a, an authorization code or, or whatever it's called. You get the screen that pops up that confirms your payment um, with the transaction ID or something like that, similar to what we've provided here. Um, so I would just note that in terms of this form of payment that is, that is very widespread now, um, this is a receipt that again clearly notates what it's for. It is further explained 
by the affidavit of Syed Salah um, indicating what that payment, what those two payments collectively were made um, to accomplish. Um, additionally, as, as Senator Curran has noted, um, there this, this money initially was not part of the campaign finances report. Um, I will note, he said, as of April 2nd, obviously this complaint was even brought. I went back to review. I think the complaint was signed um, and notarized on May 22nd. Um, again, we have conceded that that was an error on Senator uh, Fatah's part, and he has, at this point now, completed a report amendment reflecting that payment. So that has been, that error has been uh, remedied. Um, in terms of advertising on Somali TV, again, this is something that, for Senator Fatah, he looked to all of the other local politicians who have also advertised with Somali TV. Um, so I think to imply that there's any sort of intent to improperly pay for advertisement on a platform that he should not, um, I don't think that there can be any intent that can be shown or any reckless disregard for rules when he has the um, the example of Governor Walls, of Al Franken, of Dan Severson, who are also all using this platform um, as a space to, to buy advertisement space and um, to also advertise their campaigns. I will just also note, um, in terms of the disclaimer, again, according to that affidavit and uh, what Senator Fatah has shared, he did provide the information for the disclaimer. Um, again, to have that Fair Campaign Practices Act disclaimer on his advertisement. And Syed Saleh has indicated in his affidavit um, that he, in, in paragraph 10 and 11, that that disclaimer was provided to him when the, the payment was made, when this was requested. However, he forgot to post the disclaimer. And as we've seen, unfortunately, this is an error that it appears uh, was made by Somali TV in the past as well. But again, I think that it is a slippery slope. I would argue that it is um, a very precarious place to be in to call into question Senator Fatah's ethics based on the inaction of others after doing his own due diligence. Um, and so again, to say that he should be uh, considered in violation of ethics rules and should be held accountable for the inaction of others when he took the steps uh, to provide the disclaimer when he requested that, um, when he took the steps to pay for ad space, the same as many others have done. And then furthermore, you know, to go on and um, to author appropriations bills for many many community organizations, the same as his peers were doing, um, I, th I think is is a very dangerous precedent to set. Um, again, to say that, that when he took the steps that he did, when there was inaction by others, or um, again, things that were outside of his control, to somehow infer some sort of intent or recklessness on his part, um, and to infer that, that there was a violation of, his, of the ethical standard um, that he's under as a state senator. Mr. Chair. Uh, senator Coran, briefly. So, Mr. Chair, um, so that, again, go back to the proof of the receipt. Um, there is absolutely no proof Senator Fate made that payment. There is nothing on the receipt that indicates as, indicates as such. So without that, as well as without an invoice, it's uh, difficult to understand that it, it was identified and brought it to be uh, rectified and was going to be above, bo above board. In addition to following um, Senator Fate is following the peers, as was just stated, or appears. Senator Wall or uh, Governor Walls also utilized the same TV, but also disclosed, as any of us would, that payment and the cost for that. There's a total addition of five ads that we have. There's no invoice for the other three. What are those? Um, and so, and then in addition to the the disclaimer, it is the campaign. It's the campaign. Um, and the, the candidate's obligation to ensure those things are taken care of. If it was missed on the first ad, you have an obligation to make sure that, those, that you are in compliance. And with no receipt from Senator Fate and no invoice and no campaign finance um, indication, there's a cash payment. There's very few things that 
um, that we make that we we don't um, right, hell, heck there's sorry there's there are no receipts or no expenditures that we make that um, for our campaigns that would not be required to be submitted on a campaign finance report. So with that with their claim, I don't think they've proved any. Um, I don't think they've proven their arguments that they've met or intended to meet until this complaint was filed. And so thus our claim still holds true. Ms. Hendricks, and then we're gonna to come to questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just very briefly, I, Senator Cran has spoken a lot about proof. Um, and again, I, I guess I am unclear on what standard of proof he is looking for because we have literally provided receipts, uh, as well as a sworn statement um, by Syed Salah with Somali TV um, indicating what these payments were. I will note that the payments were, each of the two payments were for two ads at a time, adding up to the four. Um, but again, Senator Koran, the complainants have, have pointed to, in their complaint, to unsworn statements um, in newspaper articles and um, assumptions that have been made and as, as, their, as their proof in their complaint. And today we have brought before, we have filled in the blanks for the subcommittee with actual proof, with actual fact in the form of sworn notarized statements um, by, by those who know, by, by witnesses and receipts indicating that payment was made. Um, so again, I would just, I would say, based on coming into, you know, prior to today's hearing, when the complainants filed this complaint, obviously they did not have all of the facts, but today before the subcommittee, you do now have the facts. And again, I would say that now that the record has been uh, made more complete with those facts, I don't think that you can find probable cause to continue on um, with, with any sort of inquiry into an ethics violation for Senator Fata. Mr. Chair, briefly. Uh, Senator Curran, we're gonna move on because we've gone back and, back and forth a Mr. Chair, I think this one, Mr. Chair, I think this one's pretty simple. Okay. Please show us on that particular receipt of, or the payment on receipt where it indicates Senator Fata made the payment. Well. Senator Coran, uh, that's the first questions that were coming out of the chair. So yep. um, I think we're gonna move on to questions. Um, just to clarify, we're, we are in a hearing here not to necessarily, this is not necessarily a trial. Um, a complaint has been made. Um, we are establishing probable cause to actually investigate this. Uh, the rules of evidence in a court are not necessarily applicable to this situation. Um, that all being said, I do have some questions first and then we'll go to members of the committee. Uh, Senator Pate, who is ultimately responsible to make sure that a disclaimer is on any type of political campaign disbursement or advertisement? Who is responsible for that? Um, I, I wrote down the disclaimer on a piece of paper, um, exactly word for word how it should be, um, and provided it to Somali TV. Um, and ultimately, it's on um, the service provider to provide a disclaimer uh, on the video. Um, well, Senator Fatea, I think we'll have a disagreement here. It's it ultimately is the candidate's responsibility to make sure that disclaimer gets on there. Um, I think that would, could be debated by members of the committee, but I don't think it's going to be debated by the campaign finance board that the buck stops with the candidate. Um, so. I think we have a very serious issue in that particular regard. Um, question, uh, we receive, of course, the documentation here of $1,000. It says for Omar Fateh video. Um, first, when uh, did you establish a, uh, an amended campaign finance report that included these payments from your campaign? This week. This week? Yeah. Uh, question number two, there seemed to be quite a bit of de decent production values. Uh, were there any production costs uh, in creation of that video? Um, the payments are for all of the above. So what, what goes on is uh, you go in, you record the video, um, you, they edit it, and they post it. So the cost is for uh, the totality of the service. 
Well, Senator Fate, item number nine says here, Senator Fate provided the video for me to broadcast. That does not say to me uh, that you went in, you sat down with their organization, you provide, that, that they worked with you to create this. It says here that you provided the Correct. video. Correct, so there's, there's multiple videos that I've done. So the way Somali TV works is, if you go in there and you record a video, you pay for the service. There are other videos that uh, Somali TV allows you to post on, uh, on their, on their uh, website or Facebook. Um, for that, they don't charge anybody for that. Um, so it doesn't say video files, it says video file. I believe there was one video um, that I re-recorded uh, from another, another group and that was utilized and posted. Uh, for example, um, I did a video uh, interview with uh, WCCO um, during the last election, 2021 election. Um, that video was cropped, we provided it to them, and they shared the WCCO video uh, on their platform. Um, so that's, that's an example of what we're discussing. Um, there were videos provided regarding Senator Franken, um, I think he was a representative, Severson, um, candidate Rainbow, Senator Smith. Um, in the pack of information you provided, I have no documentation that shows that those are paid videos. Um, as far as I know, that they, that they are not paid videos. Uh, I, don't, I don't have no proof on this. Do you have any, any additional comment to that? Uh, no, the idea was that just to show that I'm not the only individual or um, candidate using the platform or the service. Um, Somali TV does not discriminate against um, any political party. Um, anyone that wants to go in and use it, uses it. Not just political folks, uh, nonprofit organizations, um, businesses. Um, the last two years, um, the state actually invested in uh, local radios and social media. Um, and Somali TV uh, did their best in terms of uh, in, in for COVID response, um, speaking to the elders, letting them, know, letting them know to stay at home during the lockdown, um, having organizations come and discuss um, uh, or talk about how they're going to go into public housing to provide groceries to elders, for example. Um, later on, uh, knowing what locations to get, uh, and locations and mosques to get um, their COVID vaccines and so on. Uh, so it's been effective for uh, as a community resource as well. Senator Fate, do you have any uh, documentation that shows that equal time were give, was given to other candidates opposing Senator Franken or Senator Smith? Uh, do you have any proof that that actually occurred? Opposing candidates in terms of like their opponents? That, that their opponents were provided equal time by Somali TV? Uh, so, so it's, not on, it's not on Somali TV to seek the candidates. It's open for anybody. They have to come to them and request it and the service will be provided. Okay. Um, one final question from me, Senator Fate. Uh, Senator Fate, have you received any remuneration whatsoever from Somali TV um, from the beginning of your campaign through today's date? Any money or remuneration money payment? Yeah. No, I'm the one that paid them. They never paid me. But I'm saying for, there are no additional, if, Senator Fede, if, if I asked for an accounting of their finances, I would not see your name appear on any type of disbursement from Somali TV as oh, an organization. No. Okay. Not that I believe. No. So far, that's the end of my question. Senator uh, Torres Ray, I believe you had a question. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a question for Senator Coran. Um, as I think about my 16 years in the Senate, I'm thinking about the multiple times where, um, you know, local newspapers or labor papers kind of ran an ad and they called, do you want an ad this month or, you know, it's Labor Day, whatever it is, uh, Veterans Day, would you like that? And, and I kind of go, yeah, I do want to place an ad. Um, okay, well, send me the graphics, whatever, or they have it on on file, they do. So, so over the years, you kind of, um, or at least I, I understand that, you know, local papers call you, they know you are kind of a friend, you pay for the ad, um, they run the ad, they already have your graphics. What is the standard? You, said, you talk about when you said um, 
Senator Fateh has not adhered to the standard of proof required by the Senate to do this, uh, b because this receipt, to me, is a, re I mean, I, I wouldn't know why Senator Fateh would pay Somali TV 500 bucks and then 500 bucks again, and it says Omar Fateh video. So, so to me, this is, this, this, this is a receipt <laughs> for a video to Somali TV, Minnesota. It's what it says. So could you, when you say that he's not adhering to the standard of proof, the, 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 what we do in the Senate, could you explain what that is? How, where is that document that says that he has to have, that senators have to have a, a receipt, a contract, and they get, uh, you know, the contract has to specify, and that. Where is that document? I've never seen it in 16 years that indicates how we do these contracts when we advertise. Senator Grant. Mr. Chair and Senator Torres raised, well, I think it's pretty clear when you look through, um, going through the basic campaign finance rules and policies and what you're required to obtain uh, or, or create, obtain in the, in the process of procuring services and then subsequently documentation that you need to retain in to support your campaign finance claim, right? Your documentation. In addition to a standard, how many contracts would you ever engage in without having even a, a bill or an invoice or to even understand what the rate charts are? And in fact, the receipt you're holding there um, or, or the documentation you vote, no, there's nothing on there that indicates who made that payment. There's nothing. An invoice is very simple. And then also the argument of, of that we're in this new world of electronic payments. I'll have you know this is probably my 35th year in electronic payments. And the beauty is they all have receipts in real time. And so to say that they don't exist in, a, in this new modern world, a receipt is required for us to, be, to, to get acquired and to, retain, to be retained from a campaign, campaign finance perspective to support your claims. In this particular case, that $1,000 payment, there, it appears there was no intention to actually make that claim on a campaign finance report because it didn't come until after this complaint was filed. And it's a pretty broad, it's a pretty, pretty large expense to say, I forgot $1,000 payment into an area which is complicated when you look at what we do and what campaign finance says about what we need to do, how we buy ads, well, how, what disclosures we must have. I mean, there's an invoice in every activity except for those in which you may try to, to hide. And in this particular case, it still proves nothing. The receipt you have in your hand proves nothing because it doesn't show who made the payment and who received the payment. It has a text of some minor details. Of, it could be for Senator Fate but it doesn't list for what type of services. It doesn't list any of those traditional details. And we, have to, we operate at a higher standard, right? To remove, to remove the conflict and perceived, any real or perceived conflict, and it's really clear. Have, a proof, have proof, file your report, and retain that documentation for a certain period of time. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Coran, I, I believe you, you are describing a process that, that you believe the Senate, we, as you said, that we should have. I suppose uh, Senator Fateh will have to respond to, to, to the campaign board if he did anything wrong with respect to accepting a receipt that comes in this form and reporting it later. That, that's a different system. It's not, it's not me. It doesn't include me as a senator and his colleague. Um, I interpret this as a very good receipt. It's $500, you pay for a video. Now, if the campaign board decides that this is inadequate, that you should have a contract and whatever Senator Coran is describing here, uh, I suppose you're going to do that because you have to. Uh, what the Senate has prescribed 
for us to do on how we should behave when we call a paper or paper call us and what kind of receipt and anticipation of clear documentation. And I don't know if the court does that, but we're not attorneys here trying to feel, uh, some of us are. <laughs> 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 so, uh, Senator Koran, I'm just having a hard time understanding kind of this definition uh, that you provide to the Ethics Committee about the standard of proof that should be in place for a payment of a video that clearly occurred, that clearly, in my opinion, says it was made to Somali TV, that clearly is submitted by a member. I am not in doubt that a member would bring a receipt that was paid with money from, I don't know what account. I believe if he's saying that he paid these $500, and this is a receipt, and he's submitting it to us. I, I, he's my colleague. I have, no serious, I have no reason to believe that that's not true. It was completed. It says completed, and it says it was for Omar Fateh video. So I don't know what else I could read on into that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have a couple questions. So Senator Coran, uh, I'd like to come to you first. I, I, uh, painstakingly, painstakingly read over the complaint, and I followed with you when you were going through each paragraph um, in, in the complaint. And I understand that you are looking at Senate Rule 56.1, but then in paragraph 8, you, you lift up uh, Senate Rule 56.3 that talks about improper conduct. But there's some language that I'd like for you to help me understand and how that, that would apply here. It says, uh, where I'm getting to, it says, oh, well, I guess I should read the thing. Provides that improper conduct includes conduct that violates a rule of the Senate. And here's the, the language. Violates accepted norms of Senate behavior that betrays the public trust. So can you give me an example of what that means and what that has meant historically, if you know, and, and, and how you think that applies here? Because I think it's possible for someone to, you know, uh, forget to put a disclaimer on, and maybe maybe provided the information for uh, Somali television to put the disclaimer on, and they failed to put the disclaimer on. Help me understand how that uh, accepted practice of being a normal human being uh, violates, even though that they're running for for the Senate. Uh, can you tell me how that violates accepted norms of Senate behavior? Senator Grant. And what that means. Mr. Chair and, and Senator Champion, I think in, in the combination of the totality of the events that, um, that are contained in, throughout the entire um, complaint is that there's a series of, the series of events that have occurred. Um, it could be the simple omission on a video, right? Those things, that nobody's infallible. But... Um, five videos where that doesn't appear. It's the campaign, it's the senator's responsibility to do that. Um, this is the permanent rule, so there's, there's probably a wide variety of things that could fit into this as, as broad as it is. But then to follow it up with a cash payment, a, an electronic equivalent of a cash payment with no invoice, no record, or no proof, and then to subsequently follow up with no reporting of that particular event, even if you didn't have those other documents, right, the invoice and or a valid receipt that proves who made the payment and who made the payment to who and for what, um, you know, that they could, they could overcome that, right, if, if, all of the, if a few of those other activities didn't occur. But the totality of all of them together then says it appears that somebody was trying to violate or, or not comply with a pretty simple campaign finance process um, derived from videos or services that appear to be um, not allowed by 5013C entity in, in, uh, in the totality of this series of events. So all of them, I think, lead up to that ill or disrepute or bring that um, shed light on the Senate and the body as, as, it, re as it refers to in 56.3. So. Senator Champion. Mr. Chair, may I briefly respond as well to... Uh, uh, let's set, let Senator Champion respond first, okay. and then I'll come back to you. Senator Champion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Senator Coran, um, 
Do you believe that the Senate rules gives, gives or provides space for an individual to make an honest oversight? Like for an example, as I mentioned earlier, um, if information was provided for the disclaimer or to say, hey, put that disclaimer on there and they don't put the disclaimer on there, do you believe our rules provide for any space to say that the, that the, uh, the candidate you know, did everything that they could in order to get that information there, but the mistake lies with the entity, in this instance, Somali Television. Senator Grant. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Champion, I think uh, errors can occur, right? Again, nobody's infallible. Um, but when you look at, and I think you did mention that the, the Somali TV obligations, um, they have an obligation to adhere to their uh, business classification of a 5013C. And so, yes, they should be very aware of what that means in their operation, certainly into the world of politics. A, a, a mistake occurs in those things when they're identified and they're quickly taken care of. But when you look at the totality of these, again, an electronic cash payment equivalency on top of the lack of compliance from the, the, the disclosure elements, in addition to what appears to be a 5013C, providing services that aren't available to everybody else or any other candidates, or, and or those where other candidates have been provided, they actually do reflect those payments and the true cost of those um, in their campaigns. This doesn't appear to be a complicated process. Have receipts, provide who made a payment to who, and follow the state, federal laws, and campaign finance rules. So, Mr. Chair. Senator Champion. And Senator Curran, I also looked at paragraph 14, where you cite Minnesota Statute Section 211B.15, Subdivision 2, that prohibits a corporation from making contributions directly or indirectly or anything of monetary value, but you also, in paragraph 13, um, uh, highlight uh, you know, uh, Minnesota st uh, Statute Section uh, 211B.13, Subdivision 2, where it also says prohibits a person from knowingly. So, so I underlined knowingly receiving or accepting anything of monetary value that is a disbursement prohibited by uh, 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 the statute that I cited earlier. So um, isn't it true, or would you agree that the receipt that has been provided, if it can be demonstrated or shown, that it fulfills the financial obligation of the senator, uh, uh, that uh, then that would indicate that he did not knowingly accept anything of value from a corporation or anyone that would be in violation of the statute that I uh, put forward. Senator Cran. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Champion, in the case, if, if any proof was provided, which it hasn't been provided, either in an invoice and what those activities actually cost, um, and or a receipt that would show and indicate as such, um, you could, uh, the information that's provided said that two ads were $500, but there's no proof or anything indicating as such. And even based on that particular statement, the two $500 payments based on today's testimony would lead us to believe that maybe four of those ads were covered, yet there were five. So it still leaves in, the, in this circle of, of there were five ads and supposedly four were paid for. I, I, I think that knowingly, I think it was, no, the, uh, it was known that the compliance to our campaign finance laws um, should have been known and adhered to. Again, any one of those instances, I think you could look and say, well, I didn't knowingly do but the totality of all of them as it relates to this particular scenario, there are two or three levels of, of failure to comply. And again, I think that falls on Senator Fate and the lack of proof that's been provided. There still isn't a single piece of proof that indicates Senator Fate made a payment for those two $500. There's not one thing on the receipt that shows that at all. And so I think the, uh, the avoidance of providing that information means that they knowingly did not comply with the law. So I'm going to go to 
Ms. Hendricks in just a second, but Senator uh, Champion, I think you are going in the direction I have been thinking about in that this is, again, uh, to determine what further actions need to be taken if there is probable cause. In looking at the affidavit, I have a lot of questions for that individual, as well as questions regarding the other candidates. Was there equal treatment played on, uh, for Senator Franklin, Senator Smith, et cetera? Uh, were there any uh, discounts? Those type of things. These are questions that are in my mind now that may be a reason for us to take further action beyond today to determine is it if, if this is all kosher, so to speak, that maybe it's not good, maybe it isn't an issue. However, we're looking at probable cost to say should we investigate this count or this affidavit to determine are there, uh, is this innocent or is this, is there something else behind it? So that's the direction we're going today. So, Senator so, Champion. Mr. Chair, I think that, um, you know, that we should always look at a number of different things. And I think uh, that Senator Fate's presentation thus far uh, seems to, uh, I think that it sounds like the committee is accepting this um, positioning uh, in a different way. Because it sounds like to me that from your statements, Mr. Chair, that when Senator Fate now starts outlining other people who use the benefit of Somali television for ads, that it seems to suggest that they were somehow in lockstep with getting benefits that uh, they should not be receiving. Uh, and so I'm not certain that Senator Fate uh, means that uh, in that particular way. And I can't speak for him because I'm not his lawyer and I have not had any conversation with him. But that is a very dangerous thing to do, right? Is because it seems to suggest something that is not happening. I think Senator Fate, and maybe I'll ask you, you do recognize, or do you, recognize that having an ad on Somali television is not a problem, that people uh, of any persuasion can go to Somali TV and pay for an ad because that's what, what, what happens. You do recognize that that's separate and different from what is before this body when we think in terms of um, uh, uh, what is or what occurred with you as an individual as opposed to the other folks that you put up on the screen? Senator Fate. That is correct, Senator Chambu. So, Mr. Senator Chair, Chim. with that, I, I hope mm -hmm. that you appreciate that because I think the way that it was outlined seemed to suggest that everybody's in lockstep in some of the way, go in there, get whatever you want, and I think that's as far from the truth as possible. Um, so, again, um, I just wanted to just make sure that I talk through that because I understand um, the chair's concern and what it may have sounded like, uh, but I just want to say that it didn't sound that way to me and that I think it's important for us to bifurcate the issue that, that before the body. Ms. Hendrick? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to also respond further to, to Senator Champion, um, that is correct. Obviously, the ads that we provided uh, for this, this meeting today, for this hearing today, were not to suggest any sort of lockstep of impropriety or, or anything that was happening across the board, but, but simply to respond to what was in the complaint, not the moving bar that we now see today. Um, but, but obviously, if we go back to the complaint and what we are here today to respond to, um, there were allegations of an endorsement. And so we provided those other ads to show, one, that this is a resource used widely uh, by members of both parties, um, by many, many local politicians, um, and also to show that the format of the ads that were provided by complainant of Senator Fata are no different than the form of the others um, because the the title of the videos, the fact that they were titled uh, Vote for Senator Fata was being pointed to, it seemed, as an indication that this was an endorsement and not a paid ad. And so this was more the ads that we provided of other local politicians, um, of other local prominent politicians show again, that this form, the format was the same. Um, and again, that this was a resource that was used 
used by everyone. Um, again, that this was ad space that was provided to members of both parties um, who were interested in reaching out to their to the Somali community around them. It's it is possible that there are certain people who are um, campaigning for positions that may not deem it necessarily uh, necessary to reach out to the Somali community, but obviously for those that, that see that benefit, um, it is a resource there. They can go and buy ad space there. The same way that not everyone has to buy ad space on the same billboards off of Highway 13 or anywhere else in the Twin Cities or in the state. Um, again, people can choose where they want to allocate their ad money um, and those resources of their campaign. I just wanted to briefly, if I may, um, respond to a couple of other pieces of that overall discussion. I, I think it's I think it's troubling to hold a different standard um, in the in the arguments that uh, because there is there aren't certain types of invoices or certain types of receipts. Um, I, I think that by by making those arguments, it, it's troubling to me because of the fact that when we look at the the corporations, the outlets that maybe some would go to um, to run their, their advertising, things like billboards or some legacy news uh, stations like Fox or NPR or uh, locally WCCO or CARE 11. These are, well, are, are very entrenched, established um, legacy organizations or I think Clear Vision owns billboards and things. So obviously, the, the things, the types of invoicing that they have are going to be different than maybe someone who is newer to the game or a smaller company like, uh, a smaller organization like Somali TV. The same way that if you go to Starbucks, you get a different type of receipt than you might from the little local mom and pop coffee shop uh, in downtown Hastings. So it's a different system. They're simply uh, due to scale and and the um, simply I would say due to scale and the amount of time that these folks have been in operation. I also think it's troubling to point to something like a cash app receipt, which the senator has referred to as a receipt number a number of times himself, while then also calling it not a receipt, and say that this is like just paying cash or this is not um, akin to making a, a bank payment. As we're all aware, there are many members of our communities uh, who do not have access to traditional banking. And, and a lot of people are using things like Cash App and these other app-based um, programs as, as a supplement or as a, in place of traditional banking that they don't have access to. And so to say that that individual is not capable because they're using Cash App, because they don't have a, a bank account, because they can't get one um, at somewhere like Wells Fargo. I think we're, if, we, if we draw this out, we're saying that that person can't have the same type of receipt and the same type of bank records, because we're not going to recognize that a receipt from something like Cash App is the same as a receipt from one of those other banking um, institutions. I, I will just note as well, as we've continued this conversation, the bar seems to be moving. In the complaint, uh, the complainants first say that there was that this was an endorsement, and we've shown, and it seems that they've conceded that this is more of an ad, and it has been shown by the fact that we've provided other ads of the same format. Um, they said that this was free ad space. Again, we've shown through the receipts that this was not free. This was paid ad space. Um, again, the the overarching message of this first complaint is is uh, waving a flag saying there's a conflict of interest. And again, we've shown that this was paid ad space. It was an ad just like many other local politicians have had. So there's none of that. And so now the argument seems to be moving to more of a complaint about insufficiency of receipts and what, what should be a receipt and not, and um, whether or not certain disclaimers were followed. Uh, as stringently as they should have or, or his campaign followed up on those. I, again, I would say that we've now moved beyond what's even in the complaint. And again, when uh, there's a discussion of further investigation potentially into Somali TV, I would argue that, again, there's not probable cause then to continue on with this investigation into Senator Fatah 
because again, he, he is not one and the same with Somali TV. And so if the question is, is Somali, now is Somali TV providing access to all politicians, when again, we've seen politicians on both sides of the aisle who've advertised there, um, are they following the things that they need to do as a 501c3 corporation? Again, those, I believe, are an in, more of an indictment on Somali TV and not pointing to any sort of potential ethical failing or complaint against Senator Fatah. So again, I would argue that if that is the direction that we're going in now, that there is not probable cause to continue on with this investigation of complaint number one to Senator Fatah. Um, and again, this that complaint should be concluded for him today. If, if the subcommittee finds that it's important to look into Somali TV further, that, that is obviously in the subcommittee's prerogative. But again, in terms of Senator Fatah and the complaint before the subcommittee today, I would argue that with this moving of the bar, um, with the direction in which the inquiry has gone, this has moved away from Senator Fatah and is now maybe a question of others as opposed to um, anything that would point to, uh, to an ethical feeling on his part. Uh, well, Ms. Hendricks, I'll, I'll disagree with you in that we're not, I don't believe we're straying away from it. I think what we're trying to do is provide additional context and additional get additional information to determine is this something that we need to move forward with. Um, I think standard practices that every, almost every, and I can't think of one that doesn't, follow, which is when you buy advertisement, you have a receipt. And you get, you, you actually in newspaper business, you are told how many times it's gonna run and on what dates. Same thing goes with uh, video advertisements. Um, there's, cons I think it's a legitimate question to say, where is this available? And it is to the, I mean, we're talking right now to the affidavit. There's a lot of questions I have for the individual who submitted the affidavit. Uh, one final question, then we'll go to, or one final comment, and then we'll go to Senator Kiffmeyer. Just because the organization is new, and I believe it was begun in 19, 2016, I think I read someplace, just because they're new doesn't necessarily mean that they, do, they are exempt from following standard practices that every other ad organization that receives advertisement revenue follows. Um, I would think that their general counsel or whoever is the legal counsel for Somali TV would probably be telling them these are the things you need to do to receive advertisement. If you're just a nonprofit and you're just doing community service, that's one thing. But when you're receiving ad revenue, that type of activity has some pretty decent guidelines. And I will agree with you that talking, going into talking about a 501c3 is probably something for the federal, uh, federal folks to do. But I think what we're trying to do here is determine and find out, do we need more information? Do we take action today? I don't think we do. Um, but I think we have to, we have some, I have certainly some questions for the, the person who submitted the affidavit. That's why we may be coming back here next Wednesday. So we'll move on to Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, one of the things, the uh, question was brought up here as, is this properly brought before this Senate committee? But all regards to um, the standards of ethical conduct, 56, that is reference 56.3, but in particular, the overarching beginning one says, members shall adhere to the highest standard of ethical conduct as embodied in the Minnesota Constitution, state law, and these rules. Well, I wanna to point to the highest standard of ethical conduct includes state law. State law has campaign finance requirements. So under 56, you have requirements as a senator to make the reports, to submit the information, to do everything that is in Minnesota campaign finance law. So it's also these rules, without regard, of course, to these rules. And there are other rules that are listed out here in the Senate rules. But specifically, it references the highest standard of ethical conduct in regards to state law. And so that introduces every concept of a campaign finance filing uh, into this hearing. And so it is very, very um, germane to our discussion in this Senate committee. 
Um, one of the things is that there has been introduced now other people. And I would say rather specifically, and I have to go back and listen to a recording, uh, there was a very strong implication that these others did this the same way. How would you know what was the same way if you didn't talk to them or hear from Somali TV what was the standard? So it's being referenced here, but we have no documentation as to what that was. And so they actually are being tied into this complaint because they have been used and named and a statement made that uh, as they have done, so have you. And so I think it's going to be very important to find out uh, what kind of conversations there were that led you to think that this was okay. The second, and I don't know that you can answer that question necessarily right now. I don't necessarily have that expectation of it, but I think it does need to be answered. The other thing is that uh, proof of this $500 payment, it states it's for Omar Fateh, and the payment was made, but it's the affidavit states here, number six, uh, that this paid $500 to Somali TV through me, through this person. So cash from one person to another person. There's no proof here that I see submitted that this was made by Senator Fateh, it's just that it was a payment made. And so usually you would have a bank statement that would show that there was a debit, um, some other way to show that this was an actual payment made by Senator Fateh. Um, so the biggest thing you have here is that this is proof that Siad received $500 twice, total $1,000, uh, in his affidavit stating that it is through him to Somali TV. Again, I don't see any proof of that. I don't see any proof here. Um, I'd be looking for some financial documents. And again, Senator, uh, Mr. Chairman, that would have to do more with the uh, Somali TV than with Mr. Fateh, but that would help to prove that um, what is stated here, but I would be looking for a bank statement, I'd be looking for a debit transaction, and I think again, I've done many of these kinds of digital transactions, always there is with an invoice of some sort that states how many times the ads were gonna be run, what was the value. I took a quick look at Somali TV for their ad rate, I couldn't find any, if this is open to the public, generally it is advertised as such, and the ad rate, uh, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, two minutes, whatever it is, the price goes up depending upon the length of time. And production costs are also, um, this could easily be $500 just for production. We don't know, it says for video, we don't know other than this um, affidavit. And so there are a lot of questions that I've here, but Senator Fateh, the biggest thing is, that in the Senate rules, you're required to comply with state law and to the highest uh, standard of ethical conduct as well. And just in regards to that alone, um, there are serious um, questions in regards to that. I would say that the big thing is the lack of proof. There's a claim here, but there's no proof. And I think lacking that proof, there's no factual conclusion to be made, and in general, when these kinds of things are done, there is a digital proof other than just this kind of uh, screenshot. It even goes there, um, so if you'd like to respond to that, I'd be glad to hear your response. Ms. Hendrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Kiffmeyer, thank you for your questions. Um, I'll go through them. I know there were a number of questions in what you outlined, so I'll just take them one by one. Um, you started out by, by pointing to paragraph eight of complaint one um, with Senate Rule 56.3 um, about the accepted norms of Senate behavior um, and what, what constitutes improper conduct. I will just note, um, again, with, the, with pointing to that violates accepted norms, as we've indicated, Senator Fata has, has amended his report at this time. The fact, I would argue that the fact that there is, um, 
there is in place a way for individuals to go, for senators or other elected officials to go, uh, candidates to go and to amend those reports, the fact that that exists as a, as a as something that you can do, as, as I'm sure a form that can be filled out, um, the existence of that mechanism would seem to point that this is that he is not the first person, perhaps even in this room, to have to use a form like that to correct a mistake once it is brought to his attention. And obviously, um, in this complaint, that mistake, again, in going back and getting receipts and as, as evidence has been gathered to respond to this complaint, when that mistake came to light, that is something that he did. So again, I would, I would just argue that the fact that that mechanism even exists would seem to point to something that this is, an, it is accepted, it is a norm that this can happen, that as Senator Champion earlier stated, Folks are not infallible, they're human. I, I know all of you have great uh, responsibility and authority in your positions, but again, uh, with respect, obviously everyone in this room is human and capable of making mistakes. Obviously there is the mechanism here to go and to correct that mistake, which would seem to indicate that this is something that that is identified as something that can and does happen. Um, and allowing that mistake to be corrected is something people aren't just immediately charged with crimes or brought before this uh, subcommittee. I, I believe I understand that it's been seven years since this subcommittee has met. I would, I would guess, I don't know for a fact, I will be um, clear on that, Senator Kiffmeyer, but I, I would guess that it has not been seven years since someone had to submit a form of that nature um, to correct a mistake. I would also guess that there are probably mistakes that have been made that have never been corrected um, because nothing ever happened to bring them to light. Um, in terms of the other ads, again, this is these other ads, we did not bring those before the subcommittee today to indicate any sort of to point fingers at anyone else or, or anything of that nature. Um, as, we further, as we earlier outlined, um, again, in the complaint, as is before the subcommittee today, I will note that the, in the complaint, it stated that there was an endorsement. And so again, the ads that we brought before everyone today um, and that we provided, um, all of those ads were to show, again, that that this was not an endorsement, this was the same form, this was done in the same way as other people were also having ads on Somali TV. Um, and again, to show uh, the similarity in format and also the widespread use of Somali TV as a platform um, to air these political campaign advertisements. Um, I will also just briefly respond. I know there's been already been a lot of discussion um, and debate about the, the payments themselves. I will again just point back that, uh, again, the receipts that we provided um, for this hearing today, again, when taken in conjunction with that uh, affidavit, I would argue again that the, the sworn statement by uh, Syed Salah with, with Somali TV as well as the receipts together do show the payment that was made. Um, again, the receipts themselves indicate what it's for. That's further clarified by the affidavit, by this sworn statement. Um, again, showing that payment was made because, because again, in the complaint, the allegations are that there was an unpaid for endorsement and that that created a conflict of interest down the road. So again, all of this information, again, I would argue, shows that this was a paid service of a, a platform that was used to advertise. Again, that the advertisements were made in the same form um, as others. And, and again, that, that this is not something that created then any sort of conflict of interest um, going forward. I, I will agree with you that uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, that again, all of this does seem to point that this is more of something to do with Somali TV, maybe, in terms of their 501c3 status or the ads that they are making for other people. 
then it has to do with Senator Fata. Again, he has no control over Somali TV's business practices and how they post their rates or how that is done. Again, he can only, we can't go into the minds of Somali TV. We can't theorize about what they're doing. All he can point to is his interaction and what he, what he and what we all can see in the public record in terms of advertisements that other folks have also um, put on Somali TV and the fact that he has shown that he paid for those advertisements. Again, they were not unpaid endorsements uh, that would underlie any sort of conflict of interest, but they were paid advertisements. Senator Kiffman, Thank you. follow up. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I was going to also um, go to this, that a mistake does not absolve guilt or responsibility or consequences. Okay, even in the campaign finance board in the case that was included in our packet here, uh, it was recognized that the senator's, uh, at that time, a representative's violation was negligent and ill-advised. And because uh, of extenuating circumstances, the fine was less than they might have fined if it were found to be purposeful. And so that doesn't mean there wasn't guilt or that there wasn't responsibility. And so no matter what, a senator is responsible for his campaign. We just kind of go back to that. And you can, to state that you're new or something else was new does not absolve responsibility or guilt or the consequences that come with that. And as a senator, um, it's more in this complaint as well, uh, in just complaint one, than just a uh, disclaimer or some of these other things. It's, it's a whole variety of them here uh, that are there. And not only that, um, the Senate rules require disclosing potential conflicts of interest at the time that a vote was taken. And so at that time, there was no filing. There was no uh, recognition of this $500. There was nothing of that. At that time, there was just simply the facts that are in front of us. So that potential conflict of interest in the discharge of their duties at the time, and we've had several senators who have stood up on the Senate floor and uh, have made potential conflicts of interest known to the senators and also have um, recused from voting at that particular time. That is Senate rules and is available to every single senator. And there are also Senate staff who, if you ever have a question, they will help you determine what is the right response. We have nothing here to show that that was um, sought. So I would hope that uh, the fact that I, when I talk about uh, the Mr. Salah here, uh, was not so much about what they did, but seeking any proof of what Senator Fateh is claiming. Because right now it's a claim. Uh, the picture we have here, $500, is not proof. It is a claim. Uh, it's a statement uh, uh, from him that a payment was made, but it does not equal proof uh, that Senator Fateh made that payment. It does not include proof uh, even of what it was for in general, because as Senator Fate said today, there were productions, there were things that they did to make these ads, yet one was filed. So it implies there is more here than this money being gone for than just submitting a file and running the ads. There was some production here. But without that additional information, possibly uh, Mr. Selah would possibly have additional information that would have some of that. But without that here today, I cannot determine that. And what I deal have here is the facts just faced in front of me, and they, uh, they do not answer the questions posed to this committee by the complainant. Uh, Senator Coran, you have something to add? Then I'll come back to Senator. Uh, yeah, Senator thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh, the, the uh, statement just made in regards to the payment made, and we're kind of seeking when the um, campaign finance report was updated. It appears it's certainly, I think, the indication that it was updated just yesterday, or at least after 10 a.m. yesterday. And was a, was a campaign report filed and amended 
and when was it? And was it for payments made to or payments of any other kind? Would that report reflect that was filed yesterday? What could, could Senator Fate explain what the amended report states that was filed yesterday? Senator Fate? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I went to the campaign finance office and met with them and um, sought their guidance. Uh, they sat with me and uh, they said the most appropriate uh, way to amend it was uh, to have an in-kind contribution followed by an in-kind in expense. Um, and that's the way it was filed. Senator, or Mr. Chair. So this, this does raise an interesting question. So Senator Fate, uh, there is no receipt that you have provided the $1,000. You're saying that you are now, which is perfectly legal, uh, it's under the $1,000 cap that Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, what's his name? CSL. Uh, Salah has provided you a $1,000 in-kind contribution, and that's no. what your accounting is? No, from my, own, from my own self to my campaign. So, so I, the money goes to my through the campaign, and then it counts as an in-kind expense as well. Okay, so, so Senator Fate, you're saying then that there's a thought, you made a $1,000 contribution to your campaign, which then is compensating the $1,000 that As an Mr. Expense. Salah provided? To, to Somali TV. So it, it goes as, a, as an expense to Somali TV, Minnesota. Right, and I understand, Senator Fate, I understand that. There's a $1,000 expense, <clears throat> excuse me, but I'm trying to figure out I, the, I guess the question I would have is if you are making an in-kind contribution from your personal funds, yes. um, did you sign the campaign finance agreements that allowed that kept you under a $5,000 cap? And did that exceed the $5,000 cap? Because as you know, when you sign the public subsidy agreement, there is a cap that you as a candidate, if you did not sign that, then and you did not exceed it. I guess I'm just trying to find out, make sure there's not another problem that just came up. Yeah, I don't believe I exceeded it. I have spoken with them, I met with them. Um, we went through <coughs> the previous reports um, and they deemed that um, the corrected actions were appropriate. Well, Ms. Ms. Hendricks, this, again, we're gonna be meeting again. This may be, I hope you're taking a to-do list <laughs> of issues that this can be very helpful to your cases we would, I think the committee would like to see that transactional information so we understand how was this, how's the thousand dollars, how did the thousand dollars get to Somali TV? Is this, if, if Mr. Site, Mr. Salah paid the thousand dollars and then now Not it's him. being paid again, I guess I'm a little confused here. Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I can respond to that. Um, I, I think what we're trying to explain is that, and again, I wasn't part of the conversation um, with Senator Fate yesterday, but but as we've seen on the on this receipt, um, and as has been explained, Senator Fata inadvertently paid Somali TV from his private cash app account, not from the campaign. So what what the campaign uh, finance oh, office board told Senator Fatah to do was to show basically the, if let's say $1,000, it's two, we know the $1,000 is two $500 payments. Um, but just for clarity, I think in this discussion, if we just refer to it as the $1,000, what they basically told him to do was to show the, a two-step process, to show that $1,000 going from him personally as an individual to his campaign and then further to show that $1,000 going, dispersing out of his campaign funds as payment for the ad. So because it, while we know that it, it didn't in fact go, it inadvertently went directly between his personal account paid directly to Somali TV for the $1,000 expenditure um, for advertisement, what they told him to do was to basically show an intermediary step of it going from basically showing that that $1,000 was a contribution to his campaign that then was dispersed 
to Somali TV as payment. Oh, I think I see, Ms. Hendricks, I think I see where you're going. For the next hearing, my suggestion is uh, providing us the documentation that shows, and I think I know what you did here, You've, you're showing an in-kind contribution from from Senator Fate to his campaign, and then an expenditure of the thousand yeah. dollars to okay, that's well, two five hundred, two five hundred dollars. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm just saying a thousand make yeah. it easier. So, yeah. Mr. Chair, I think we have that that answer, Sen uh, Senator but, Champion, but, and then Senator Coran. Senator Champion, I, okay. and it might be helpful. Do you have a receipt from Somali TV reflecting the thousand dollars that was paid to it? Because if you're going to close the 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 gap in yep. order to make sure that you're protected, yeah. for uh, lack of a better word, is uh, do you have a receipt that shows that that money, in fact, landed in the coffers of Somali TV and therefore credits you for that payment? Okay, Senator Fatay. Yes, yeah, uh, we can provide that information, and I can also provide the receipt. Um, I think I think I think Cash App also has a web receipt a version that'll show my Wells Fargo account. If that'll be helpful, I could bring both the Somali TV receiving it as well as me paying it. Well, Senator Fate, just to maybe amplify this, so we understand the thousand dollars. Yes, there's no question there. I think what Senator uh, Champion, we've been talking about invoicing and pricing and that yeah. kind of thing to Correct. make sure that that everything is is above board. What we're talking about is a document from. Somali TV that says that they received the thousand dollars, and I'm getting a nod over here. So it, yep. it's no, no no more of this. We don't we don't need to talk about the, the the internet transaction. It is from their accounting of an invoice saying here you go. Um, I do have a lot of questions for Mr. Salah that I think he needs to come before this committee so that we can ask these questions because there's there's a lot of in my mind a lot of outstanding questions, and maybe we'll get to that next week. Senator Fate. Yeah, um, can, can I respond to uh, also a previous comments? Um, so number one, um, I've already owned the mistake that uh, I used the wrong cash app, and we tried to make that amendment uh, to fix that mistake, and I met with uh, the campaign finance board, and they've done that. Um, now, um, Senator Kiffmeyer also indicated that, also stated that um, I didn't disclose uh, a conflict of interest when there was a vote. Um, there was never a vote. The bill was drafted. And within a few days, um, we realized that it would never get a hearing. So uh, the bill never got a hearing. Uh, it was never voted in hearing, and it was never voted on the floor. So there was no action done after the drafting of the bill. It essentially died. It, so I just want to make that clarification. And Mr. Chair, Ms. I, thank you. I, I will just also add, the, again, this idea of the conflict of interest is based on a premise of an unpaid or unfair advantage type endorsement from Somali TV. So again, I, I think that with what we've shown, and I understand that the subcommittee wants further information and investigation into um, in a later hearing into, into this payment, into the ad, and, and how it, it, my understanding is an inquiry into how Somali TV runs their, their advertising, kind of part of their, their corporation. Um, but what I would say again is I, I don't, just to respond to that particular point, again, because this was a paid advertisement, I would argue that there wouldn't be any reason for Senator Fata to make any sort of um, a declaration of conflict of interest, even if this had ever gone to the floor to be voted on because of the fact that there was no conflict of interest, because the premise upon which that conflict of interest argument is being made is refuted. And so, I mean, this was a, this is public information. This is out there. This isn't something, I think when we talk about people um, talking about a conflict of interest, these are things that people need to draw light to because they are hidden from, from public knowledge. Um, the fact that he used, uh, that he bought an advertisement space on a, on a Somali TV is not a conflict of interest and is also something that is widely known, um, widely available. So again, I, I just wanted to respond to that one point as well. Thank Senator you. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I just want to be clear because I think I heard, um, and we had, are not able yet to see the actual amended report, 
Did he say in-kind contribution? Senator Kiffmeyer, my, my read on this, and again, this is it's unfortunate that the documentation was not provided to us mm -hmm. at this hearing that we need to see it, is that uh, because the money came out of a personal account, Senator Fateh, assuming he has not exceeded a cap, is creating a in-kind contribution to his campaign to pay, in such a way, pay back the money to his private account, and then it turns into a expense on the on the actual ad itself. And I, I think I can read how he's trying to do that, but I think we need to see it to see the transaction and all the transactional information, perhaps even uh, Mr. Sigurd. Uh, Jeff Sigurdsson, Sigurdsson uh, mm -hmm. may want to uh, be here next time to amplify that this is the way it's going. I just, we're, I guess we're treading closely on going past probable cause into investigation, but we may. It is something that's still outstanding in my mind, as well as lots of questions for Mr. Salah, Senator Kipmeyer. Yeah, I think the big thing is to be reminded, though, that in-kind contributions are for for goods or services. So if somebody donates their labor for a fundraising event, they can receive an in-kind contribution. But if it is cash, then it needs to be cash. So I'm not familiar with any sort of thing that allows you to do a cash in-kind. Matter of fact, I believe that is not allowed. So I think there may be a misunderstanding, but without seeing the objective evidence, cannot really determine that. Matter of fact, you can only take cash out of your campaign. I think the limit is $20 in cash, technically, such as you go to county fairs and you may have a cotton candy or a 4-H uh, milkshake. They don't give receipts. It's a cash thing, but there's a limit of $20 for that. There is a specific limit in state law in regards to using cash. And so I'm not sure that this even qualifies because if this is $1,000 cash, but then we have to see that digital record, which is what we're referring to here. I think the other thing is that the connection of the bill introduction and the ads are the connection not necessarily the vote. I was adding additional information about potential conflict of interest declaration if it were to come to a vote. But it is the connection itself in introducing the bill that makes that connection. The potential conflict of interest is a separate issue. So Mr. Chair, with that, that's what I have for today. Sen uh, Senator Coran has had something. Did you want to be a past? Senator yep. Fate raised his hand. Senator Coran. Mr. Chair, um, I, I think the conversation around this particular transaction um, clearly um, proves a point to move forward to probable cause. There's so many unanswered questions. We just spent the, the whole morning talking about that there was a particular proof of receipt that um, a payment was made and that there, was an in, that there were no invoices available and then implied that um, new payment technologies in the community are not widely accepted or widely available. I'm talking about payment technology today that requires a bank account on both sides of this particular uh, cash app transaction or a, or a Venmo or whatever it would be. And then to point to an invoice, um, which was implied that, well, we could get an invoice. If that was true, it would be available today. The, a business, regardless of their status, is required to track every single transaction, income, out, incoming and outbound, re receipts and, and obligations and payments. Um, those are those are federal tax law obligations. So all of those are simple transactions that are required for any basic legal activity. And, and so those should exist. And, and with the in light of this in-kind modification, I think clearly warrants that um, there's enough probable cause to really determine or, or to have the, the information provided, invoices, and prove the payments, and ensure that the actual um, Campaign reports are filed accurately as well. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Fate. Uh Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to speak to um, Senator Kef Meyer's um, comments on record keeping about um, cash in-kind contributions. On the Campaign Finance Board website, it says for cash in-kind contributions over $20, um, you must keep the following records. Uh, name and address of the, comp uh, of the contributor, uh, the amount of the contribution, the date the contribution was received, um, 
employer of the, con of the contributor and the registration number. And all that has been um, provided uh, to the campaign finance board. So members, uh, we're past noon. Um, I think I already sort of set a soft <laughs> deadline at 12, 1230. I, going into the next charge is probably going to take us at least a couple of hours, if not longer. Um, I think we have a lot to digest as far as where to go with charge number one. Um, which, you know, in asking the campaign finance board as, as well as Mr. Salah, that treads very closely to going to establishing probable cause. Uh, I think we should chew on that one to determine if that is the next steps at the next hearing. It's entirely possible we may have some people come to us and to explain some of this stuff that it turns not into probable cause. But I think it's straying rather close to it. Uh, and I think we need to consider that. But at considering the time frame we're at, um, I would allow uh, either party to make a closing statement and we will, we will recess to next week at 10 o'clock in this room uh, unless, object, unless a member objects. <coughs> Senator Champion. Mr. Chair, I don't object, but I do have one question for uh, Senator Fate. Sure, Senator uh, Champion. Because I want to make sure that certain information not just left hanging mm -hmm. out there that he gets a chance Thank to you. speak to it, right? Yep, Senator so, Champion. Uh, Senator Fate, um, it's kind of two quick questions, right? Um, mainly, I see, because I heard what Senator Kiffmeyer said and others were saying as the nexus between the conflict of interest, and so I want to kind of give you a chance to give us your perspective on this. When I look at the affidavit of Mr. Salah in, in paragraph 15, which is what they're gleaming from, it says, um, I do not recall the exact date, but sometime in late 2020 or early 2020, 21, Senator Fate contacted me to tell me that he had learned about a state program that could help provide grant funding to Somali TV and that he was going to pursue it. Um, so two questions. Um, I'd like to know why you decided to only to, to identify Somali TV as the entity that you put a bill for, forward to so, so, so that we would know that. And, and number two, um, maybe in a close second is uh, there are other Somali outlets such as uh, Sahan Journal, uh, Cali Radio, um, uh, African News, uh, Miss Hale. I'm yeah. not sure if I'm yeah. saying that correctly, but there are other outlets that ha have provided, as you talked about, uh, a number of, of important services for the Somali community that I was in integral in when it came to like for the COVID stuff. So can you help us understand uh, why, you, why those groups um, yeah. were not considered? And I guess the third question is whether you did any ask through any of those entities. No. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Champion, for the question. Um, in my, doing my research in the first couple months um, in office, um, I looked at the different types of appropriations that folks have done for the constituents and um, organizations. Um, Somali TV has been a resource not just for my district, but uh, statewide for the Somali community. Um, at the time, I, I did approach them, and I spoke to them about uh, a couple of opportunities. Number one, um, seeking funding through the legacy, the legacy grants. Um, but number two, also, that there's a possibility for uh, direct appropriations. And I got a couple other senators to co-author. Um, I approached them because at the time, um, up until, I don't know, maybe a year ago, um, they were based in my district. They were off of Franklin and 13. Um, so they were an entity within my district uh, looking to expand. Um, afterwards, uh, I, I believe they moved now just a block or two um, outside of the district. But at the time, I was looking to help an organization uh, that benefits the community, but that was also specifically within um, District 62. And Senator Champion? And did you do any ads with some of the other um, Somali outlets that I just talked about? Um, I don't remember all of them that you listed, but I don't, I don't believe I've done ads with those individuals. I may have done interviews, um, but I don't believe advertisements. Thank you. Thank Any you. additional questions from the, from the committee? So before we recess, any closing comments to charge number one, Senator Coran? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, from, as it relates to complaint number one, I think the conversation today has led that there's been, there was ample time from the time the complaint was actually made and filed. 
it appears that that particularly drove some activities um, to try and cover, but certainly enough time to be able to provide the absolute proof that um, actions were taken when disclaimers were not, were the, when they were discovered, they were not in, in place. Um, campaign finance, the lack of reporting it on the campaign finance report, and even now, the greater confusion in the campaign finance report and trying to make uh, it right in the amended filing. But certainly, the simple trail of the, the payment, who made the payment when, and the invoices for those. There are obligations on the business side, and certainly obligations on and being a campaign, being a candidate as well as a senator to make those obligations or to meet those obligations to remove any uh, any visual aspect of any conflict of interest perceived or real. And so, with the conflicting statements, I think it's uh, clear proof that the probable causes have been proved, proved to move forward, and it must. Uh, be investigated for the at least on complaint number one for today. Thank you, Mr. Chair and the committee. Mr. Ms. Hendrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, we'll just um, for the committee as we've we've already stated. I would say that today we have addressed the issues in the complaint. Um, obviously, there was the the allegation of a conflict of interest, um, and that conflict of interest in the complaint was based on an unpaid endorsement um, that was alleged to have been given to Senator uh, Fata. Again, I understand if the committee wishes to have some further information to just see that update, that amendment um, to the records to get a little more information about Somali TV. However, I would say that, again, based on the facts that are before the subcommittee today, there is no indication of any conflict of interest here. This was a paid advertisement. There's no indication of connection between Senator Fata and Somali TV beyond the fact that they were a vendor for a paid service, um, the same way that anyone else who would um, author an appropriations bill for that would be to the benefit of Target, who does their grocery shopping there, doesn't actually have a connection to Target just because they shop there or have their credit card or something. Um, again, there is, there is no shown connection here that would form a conflict of interest. The only connection, again, is that they were a vendor of a paid service that he used um, in the furtherance of his campaign, the same as many other politicians have used. Um, and the connection that they are or were at the time uh, part of his district and constituents of his. The same, again, as many other senators have authored um, appropriations bills for uh, community organizations who are connected to them by being part of their district. Um, so again, I would argue that today no probable cause has been found um, to go forward on an ethics, uh, on any sort of a complaint of an ethics violation on Senator Fatah's part based on some sort of conflict of interest. I would argue that even the evidence as it sits uh, today um, in the file shows that this was a paid advertisement, that no conflict of interest was there. And I would also just lastly argue that with all of these questions about Somali TV's adherence to federal tax law, to the things that they are doing on their part, again, that doesn't form requisite probable cause of any sort of conflict of interest or wrongdoing on Senator Fatah's part. Um, any questions about that? Again, anything that Somali TV was doing themselves with their own taxes, with their own bookkeepers, again, cannot form probable cause again, of any wrongdoing done on Senator Fatah's part. Thank you. So members, just to, as, a, as a closing statement, um, I think we need to be careful, we need to be careful on uh, what probable cause is. Probable cause is not guilt. Probable cause is, is there grounds for this committee to investigate further? Um, we're not determining that today. We're not working on count number two today. Uh, but I think you have to think in your minds, is there, are there valid reasons to be concerned about charge number one that warrants an investigation? The investigation may conclude that there was no wrongdoing, which is entirely possible. 
Um, it may determine uh, that there was some type of wrongdoing, but it may not rise terribly high to the point of any type of action that the Senate would take. I will say this, that if we begin as an ethics committee in this body to start to raise ethics complaints on campaign finance, every campaign finance violation, the ethics committee in the Senate will be very busy sometimes. Um, I'm not going in that direction, and that is not to diminish the issue we have in front of us. But uh, when you're considering what we've heard today, I think you need to consider, is there probable cause to move forward and clear? Uh, people always think that's to, uh, to, uh, to find a guilt of an individual. Is the probable cause that you're moving forward with to prove not guilty or innocence? Uh, the door swings both ways. Uh, with that, members, uh, we do have this room uh, at 10 o'clock on uh, we next Wednesday. Uh, my intention uh, next Wednesday will be to come back here, discuss count number two. This will probably be a longer hearing because we may eventually get into the discussion of probable cause. And there is also the possibility that we can go into an executive session where just the, the uh, members of the committee can talk through uh, and debate issues regarding that probable cause. I'm not sure if that's going to happen either, but uh, that's the route that I'm planning on taking, and I will see you all on t next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to mess with the schedule, but since you're having a longer hearing, is it possible that we start earlier? Um, I think we probably could, Senator Torres Ray. Um, how about? I I hate to get too early because I know that the earlier we go for those of us who have a drive, uh, who may be in the front row over there, or Senator Kiffmeyer. Does 9 o'clock sound a little bit better? So um, getting some smiles at 9 o'clock. Um, so we will, uh, we will recess this committee uh, until 9 o'clock on Wednesday, June 15th. And we'll meet again, we'll meet, meet in this room. Hearing no further discussion, this Senate or this committee is in recess.